Hello friends, welcome to AI Flux. In this video, I wanna talk about some exciting announcements from OpenAI about Dolly 2, specifically that anyone can now have access to the API interface for Dolly 2. High level, what this means is that uh, you can now programmatically just with software, access Dolly 2 to generate images. This basically means you can do it faster, you can do it in a larger bulk. So this was released last week, OpenAI, you know, they, they've had an API interface available for quite some time for their other tools, and they actually have some really interesting things available for this. Their text classification has some features that I think are really cool, but that's not what today's video is about. At a high level, the reason they're doing this is so more people can build with this, and there are certain values and attributes of this that I'll talk about later in this video um, that make their platform uh, stick out, but I don't think um, for the reasons you might think. So first off, uh, let's, talk, let's talk about what an API is. We're not gonna get into too many technical details, but I think this is important. So basically, um, an API is an application programming interface. So basically, it's, it's a generalized, um, standardized means of having a computer um, talk to another one and get something back in a kind of structured way. An API is made up of endpoints, so an endpoint is a different feature. In this case, with the OpenAI DALI API. So in this case, uh, each endpoint is this URL. Right, and what these three do, or these three features do, is you can uh, you can generate, you can edit, and you can create variations. Every website in existence pretty much has an API. Is what is giving information to the front end that then allows your human eyes to see what's going on and provide buttons that you can then click on with your mouse and you know, your keyboard. The parts of these requests basically are you know which feature you want or which endpoint you want. This token that tells them who you are and how many uh, credits you've purchased, et cetera. This content type is saying, like, how is this formatted? Um, so here uh, you can see that just like if you were using the, the GUI, uh, you have a prompt. So the prompt here, uh, you have a number of images you want to generate and then the size. And then depending on what you click or which feature you want, uh, you're going to have, you know, the edit ability variations and generations. And to be clear, um, edit is like masked in painting. They call this state of the art. I would argue maybe not that because uh, I think that mid journey and stable diffusion are now miles, if not years ahead of where Dolly 2 is. And I, the reason I think that is because um, people have realized or developers have realized, the people building these tools, that the most valuable inputs to improving these um, is understanding how people use them. And if you look at user accounts that have been released and you look at how people share and interact with these tools, um, Midjourney and Stable Diffusion are, which is one, had a better approach to that problem initially and understood that the value of you know, improving these tools and understanding features that people want and just improving the models themselves is what are people generating? Um, how are they evolving? How are they changing? Uh, how are they trying to cheat the system to get what they want. And Dolly from the beginning was very interesting, but also from the beginning completely missed building that experience. And it's ironic because in, in their thesis as to why like you as a company should use their, their service, um, they talk about using Dolly more as an experience than just like generating images. The other thing is that when you're using this API, um, you're paying for it. And all of the information you're giving, you're giving out is just going right back to OpenAI. And ironically, most of that information has to do with the gating that they're really excited about um, as a value add for this. Let's talk about what they're willing to say about this right now. So they call it state-of-the-art image generation. Um, take that for what you will. Um, they mention uh, advances in image quality, latency, scalability, and usability. Latency and scalability are infrastructure. Uh, and you'll see that what they're really excited about is built-in moderation and trust and safety. So the reason you do that is if you're a company with a ton of money, um, looking at these tools brings in certain risks. And of course, uh, if you want to be smart about that and make sure your investors keep giving you money, uh, the way you do that is by reducing risk. So what they mention is uh, incorporating the trust and safety lessons we've learned while deploying Dolly 3 to millions of artists and users worldwide. Developers can ship with confidence knowing that built-in mitigations uh, like filters for hate symbols and gore will handle the challenging aspects of moderation. So basically this means um, stuff that's really expensive or too hard that even if you had money, you couldn't build. As a part of OpenAI's commitment to responsible deployment, again, risk management, we will continue to make trust and safety a top priority 
so developers can focus on building. And they really like mentioning that. So again, then they mentioned some applications that Dolly uh, has been used for, specifically the API. So they mention uh, Microsoft's uh, designer app, which we've talked about on this channel before. Yeah, so of course, basically before this past week, uh, anyone who had an, you know, an internal partnership with OpenAI could use these. And there are a few other um, tools as well. So there's this Kala app, which is kind of a, um, like a fashion designing app, uh, like a mood board. And I think what this demonstrates is that a lot of the other value outside of the trust and safety stuff that they're showing is the ability to um, much more easily gate inputs and outputs to these tools. So for instance, um, restricting what Dolly will output to clothing or to patterns that could fit on clothing uh, or, or pattern or textures that are fabric. And uh, that's a really hard thing to do. Like it's hard enough just to get the output you want, um, but then consistently applying prompts to structures that you want uh, is a whole nother challenge. And obviously um, with their, so clearly with their uh, GPT-3 knowledge uh, that's likely been applied to this, they've thought a lot about it. And have, another great example is uh, this Mixed Tiles app, which is pretty much a way you can generate art uh, and then pay for and download it. So they're, they're clearly looking at ways you can monetize this in a pretty simple and clear way for these demos. And uh, you can see here like the idea with looking at um, specific styles, something like a time of day. So effectively um, programmatizing building prompts. So they say Pure Mixed Tiles is a fast growing photo startup. They use software and an easy hanging experience to help millions of people create beautiful photo walls. Yeah, and then they mentioned, you know, yeah, look, come build with our other products. Uh, they're really cool. So pricing, how much, is, how much does this cost? So basically, uh, a 1K by 1K resolution image is about uh, two cents. It goes a little bit down from there. Quite frankly, um, this is another in like just indicator to me that OpenAI is just completely lost as to how people use these products and explicitly how developers use these. Because with Midjourney, like I have a developer account there and all of their pricing models are, you pay one cost and it's unlimited. So there, of course there are some limits but uh, it's a flat fee and that's it. And two images per generation um, for a pretty measly resolution to me is kind of a ripoff. Of course, they're probably still operating at a loss and Midjourney um, potentially is operating at a loss because the biggest expense with these systems, as we know, as uh, the balance sheet of Stability AI has shown, is uh, it's the cost of the hardware. So it's the tooling and then of course, there's been a lot of work put in place with this API to make it safe. So the idea is if you want to have a safe system, uh, this is how much you're going to pay for that. Yeah. And then the other important thing to mention here, uh, and we're going to look at a little bit of the documentation, but um, fine tune models, th this does not apply to Dali. So this is only for GPT-3. And it's a curious thing that's missing. We have another video that actually goes over a basically a product that uses fine tuning with stability AI. Like, what do you mean there's not fine tuning for Dali? And I think this is a, a risk based decision because uh, if you're fine tuning a model, it means that you're having it do specific things with inputs that are outside of the realm of things that are observable to open AI. So, you know, if you think of waifu diffusion, if you think of furry diffusion, they're good reasons that OpenAI doesn't want that to sour their business model as to why you should use this for trust and safety. Yeah, you see that in the documentation here. So again, they, you know, it, it's funny because if you th imagine this was for Dolly, you could see a clear value add, right? So like higher quality, uh, train on more examples, um, token savings due to shorter prompts. Um, and I'm pretty sure that if you prodded them enough with their Dali bit, they would probably let you use a similar feature set that maybe is not publicly available, but uh, I could just about guarantee that they're working on this. The other thing that's interesting is they actually make it pretty clear that you have to do a lot of local kind of data work to get this to work. Using the OpenAI API and some local tools, um, a lot of times you actually train this locally. You don't use their infrastructure. And it makes sense that from a cost perspective, they wouldn't want people doing that. But we're gonna look at the image generation docs because that's what this video is about. So yeah, again, they say you can create images, you can create edits of an existing image based on a new prompt with uh, in painting. You can create variations of an existing image. So they show this here. I do think it's interesting that they just upload a separate mask. So they expect you to provide a mask and not uh, like a point cloud or anything, which I've seen before. So that I thought that was pretty smart. 
Uh, and then again, uh, they bring up this really interesting um, content moderation. They say it's a little less gated. In the end of this video, you're going to see some kind of weirdness that shows up. So they say prompts and images are filtered based on our content policy, returning an error when a prompt or image is flagged. Now, granted, they don't mention if you do or don't pay for this. And I think at this point, they probably still make you pay for this, which is interesting. Now, the really interesting part is if you have any feedback on false positives or related issues, please contact us through our help center. So this basically means, again, they have no clue how people use this and that effectively they want you to pay them to help them understand how to improve this content filter. What gets really interesting is when we look at this content policy uh, relative to some of their other rules that they talk about with uh, their system. So when we go to moderation here, right? And they break this down by category. So like hate, hate threatening, self-harm, uh, a few other really bad ones, which of course, you know, you should be able to filter for, and that should be filtered in, in every case. Um, however, I played around with this and they have something called a uh, moderation endpoint, which basically is meant to be a mock, so a clone of their Dolly API, and it'll just tell you if what you're sending in is problematic or if their current filter thinks it's problematic. And what's interesting is there are times where you'll, you'll end up with terms that are flagged that have no category score and that have no category based on these categories here. And a lot of these are still like pretty vague. So for instance, um, violence, you know, contains or promotes, glorifies violence or celebrates the suffering or humiliation of others. Technically like a, a hammer and sickle flag could equate to that. Or if you had a picture of a concentration camp or a, a, a Chinese camp or any kind of camp, you know, a military camp, that's violence violence or graphic. Again, um, they don't really make distinct definitions here. And it's not surprising because that's on, on purpose. Uh, now, what's really interesting is they reference this content policy, which for the most part, this is just copying and pasting some of those categories and then adding a few more explicitly vague ones. So for instance, uh, shocking, illegal activity, uh, deception, political, um, this, I think, is sort of, it's also kind of funny. Um, spam. So this is a big one. So uh, how on earth would you classify unsolicited bulk content? Like, what if uh, I really kind of have some problems with these? And of course, myself and a lot of people on this channel, um, we're not building businesses with these per se. But again, this really s sends the message clearly home that uh, if you want to do like really creative or edgy stuff with this, um, stuff that you could clearly do on uh, mid-journey in a way that I don't think is harmful and that I think re really is just creative, uh, then they don't want you using this. And if you're right on the edge, then you're going to pay uh, and, and have some money ha that's thrown at it to help them understand where that line is. I wish we were at a point where there was more of an ethical discussion going on than uh, digging into a, a really goofy content policy. But uh, yeah, OpenAI, it's pretty interesting. I think they kind of fell short with this. And I, th I don't think it's their fault because I think it's just, just that they don't have a great understanding because they're such a large organization of how this is going. For me, I, the biggest thing that's missing here uh, are fine tunes, which is stunning to me because there's so many people who've rolled their own infrastructure that, you know, to make avatars or to make um, profile images for dating apps. And uh, yeah, the pricing is also kind of expensive uh, and, and archaic relative to some other tools I like. Um, Midjourney is still my favorite tool for doing all of this. Like, you know, automatic 1111 is great. Like the stuff with the local GPU is great. But uh, I, I still think that Midjourney has nailed this and uh, I, I pay for it. And it's not a, an endorsement because they don't even have, for some reason, an affiliate program, which is still nuts to me. But um, as always, um, let me know what you think in the comments. If you thought this video was too long, let me know. And as always, again, I hope you learned something and I'll talk to you all soon.